made a few changes this year. Um, when Steve and I started doing this talk in 2009, uh, we were looking exclusively at Facebook games. This year we're going a little bit broader. We're calling it the year in free-to-play games, but truthfully, as we sort of filtered the stories, a lot of the stuff on mobile and on Facebook felt the most interesting to us, the most relevant to a casual games conference, so that's where we wound up focusing. Um, we've also added a third presenter, Juan Grill of Joju Games. Uh, he was one of the, uh, yep, so it's Juan. Um, so Juan, uh, together with Nick Fortuno, uh, did back in, I think, 2000, Seven, 2006, the original Year in Web Games talk that sort of uh, gave us the inspiration for this. Of course, uh, some of the presenters have had a few changes recently. So, uh, Juan, I, I wonder if you have anything you'd like to share along these lines? I'm still employed. Mm -hmm. That's what he thinks. Have you checked your email? So, yeah. this is the fifth year that we've been doing this talk. Um, and I decided, since uh, I, I prefer to sort of steal material rather than create it, to uh, grab Steve's 2011 intro slides from Casual Connect. Uh, if any of you were at the 2009 talk, Steve began the talk by comparing Facebook games in each of the years that we'd done the talk to uh, sort of a person at various life stages. So in 2009, Steve felt like uh, Facebook games were a toddler, not fully formed, energetic, full of promise. Um, in 2010, they were sort of like a, a tween, still developing, forming, not yet aware of what they're gonna become. 2011, they sort of felt like uh, a teenager, right? Not a child, not quite yet a man, still coming along. Uh, he didn't continue this, this theme in 2012 when he introduced the, the presentation, but he did use this as a kind of featured character, and I felt that was kind of apt, like vital, young, 20-something, energetic, a little quirky, maybe trying a little too hard to be liked. Um, he'd also like you to tell all his friends that you like him so that you can get a tractor. Um, so, what do Facebook games look like in 2013? Um, it pains me to say it, because I spent several years making them. I, I think in 2013, Facebook games feel a little bit like the Donald. They're well established, they have a history of success, there's a lot of money there to be had, but uh, clearly past their prime uh, and doing outrageous things to try to remain relevant. At the same time, younger, sexier competitors have moved to the front, like iOS serving a highly profitable upscale market, sort of centered in uh, uh, wealthy countries, Android bringing free-to-play smartphone gaming to the entire globe, and game makers are turning their attention to emerging platforms, even younger platforms like smartwatches, Google Glasses, and neurogaming. So, it's an exciting time of uh, change, pivoting in the, the category. So with that, um, we'd like to give you a quick overview of what we think are six of the most interesting trends in free-to-play gaming over the past year. So the first trend that I'll be taking a look at is uh, what I call platform diving. It's kind of a relative analysis of how the leaderboards and the big players are performing on mobile and on Facebook. Um, as you can see from this graph, Facebook gaming is a serious business. I should have written this on the slide, I suppose, but the numbers on the left are in billions, right? So Facebook gaming is approximately a $3 billion business at this point. It's showing continued growth, but the growth curve, as you can see, is slowing. A lot of developers feel like it's reaching the limits of its expansion. On the other hand, mobile gaming is continuing to grow by leaps and bounds globally. Nobody really knows what the limit is here. Um, just a quick footnote here. The Facebook chart rep represents about half of total global social network gaming revenues, but very few developers have had success on Facebook and elsewhere. There's more global mobile success stories, so fair enough comparison. Um, moving on, I think there's a clear feeling among developers that the Facebook race has been run. Uh, so this was the top 15 DAU chart in uh, July of 2012. Um, as you can see, it's dominated by Zynga games, absolutely dominated. So in 2013, Zynga had gone from having nine of the top 15 games to two of the top 15 games. This is great, right? Open playing field, room for everybody. However, once we start to dig a little deeper, that illusion starts to vanish. So of the top 15 games, eight were by developers that had top 15 games the previous year. Two of the new entries on the top 15, 
uh, Kalu with Subway Surfers and Supercell with, uh, I believe, Heyday. It's either Heyday or Clash of Clans on this chart. Um, are just mobile games. They have no Facebook Canvas game whatsoever. These are not Facebook games, but they have enough traction to appear on the Facebook top charts because they're using Facebook Connect to provide their social graph, right? So they're, they're counting logins here. And two of the remaining developers had top 30 games the previous year, just missed the top 15. This leaves us with two legitimate new entrants in the Facebook top 15 over the last year. Pretty simple with their hidden object game criminal case, uh, cases, sorry, and uh, miniclip.com with their billiards game. So what does this situation look like on mobile? This is the iOS, actually the iPhone top grossing chart from a year ago and today. As you can see, there's some similarity. Uh, eight of 15 developers have carried over from the previous year. But as we dig a little deeper, we see some real differences. Five completely new companies have broken into the top 15 on, Facebook, on uh, iPhone in the last 12 months. King.com and Supercell both managed to place two games in the top 15 after having zero there the previous year. Another interesting note, the Facebook chart contains only two incumbents that dropped from the top 15 altogether, while the iOS chart has eight drop developers, which really indicates kind of a great deal more fluidity both up and down on the chart at this point. Uh, the situation is even more extreme on Android. Again, quick footnote here, um, there was not a top grossing chart on Android last September, so I've grabbed the top download charts, so it's not quite apples to apples. Uh, they started tracking top grossing in September of last year. Um, but if you take a look here, only four of the top 15 games are by carryover developers. Uh, there are 10 new developers on the top 15 most downloaded chart, getting a year ago comparison for Android. So there's still a great deal of fluidity in the market, clearly, at least in terms of ability to be top of market on Android. So this has led to a number of high profile developers who had historically focused on Facebook, shifting their focus onto mobile or pulling out of Facebook entirely. This varies from high DAU players like Crowdstar, more mid-core high revenue players like Kabam are completely gone from the web platform, um, and even redoubtable entrenched Facebook players like Zynga and Playdom are doing at least as much now on mobile as they are on Facebook. So what can we as a developer publisher community take from this? It's getting very, very, very hard for new developers to break into the top tier of the Facebook charts. Leaders are entrenched. They have major advantages in terms of deep pockets, cross promotion, um, massive expertise in a very, very specialized platform. Mobile is still open, but it's getting tougher. Right? The dollars are getting bigger. Even in the last four months, I did a, a version with earlier data uh, of this section at GDC. And the number of incumbent leaders in the iOS top 15 grossing chart doubled over the last four months from four to eight. I think it was four. Um, so we're beginning to see some solidity there. So there's still opportunity, but it's getting tighter. Um, Facebook did congeal very, very fast, right? Uh, a lot of that had to do with the open viral channels, the big early raises. Um, mobile is consolidating, it's not consolidating as quickly, but it clearly is consolidating. Again, a lot of that has to do with cash advantage around user acquisition and network power and cross promotion. So if you are seeking the top of the mobile charts, it's probably a good time to start moving quickly. And talking about um, variety of um, titles and number of titles coming in and into the mobile uh, iOS chart, um, a few years ago, I organized a Casual Connect, a track called Games for Gamers. And at the time, I I, my belief was that uh, casual games were crossing gender lines. And there shouldn't be a reason why men should uh, not enjoy casual gameplay. So they just need to have content with themes and actions that were interested and appealing to them. A few people might disagree with this statement, people who think that casual games mean only games for girls. Namely, this guy right here, 
but this is a topic for a different conversation. Um, if we look at the top iOS, uh, top grossing chart, we can see that men play as many casual games as women. We see four out of 10 games here where the theme is combat and confrontation and the elements of gameplay that are traditionally attractive to men. And in fact, we could say that the, uh, there's a, even a fifth game uh, that uh, it crosses genders, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that the majority of people who are playing The Simpsons tapped out are men. When we did the, the, the talk at GDC, uh, we, we specifically talk about Clash of Clans and the success of Supercell. And as Clash of Clans is still super strong and doesn't sh show any signs of decay. We also talk about how Kabam and, uh, have been very successful into getting people to be really hooked into their games and how good their community management tools are. Uh, I feel that the key elements of gameplay in Kabam games are the social aspects. Um, uh, you, can, you can win the game by playing by yourself. You have to join a guild. You have to join a group of people. And that creates a sense of loyalty and social responsibility, putting pressure in you, the player, to participate continuously. We also talk about how uh, uh, car battle games were uh, uh, misunderstood by the game industry, and it was all about collection, why um, the biggest element in car battle games is about the fact that you're collecting cards, and that appeals to guys like us, because most of, uh, uh, most of us, when we were little kids, we were collecting stuff. We were collecting uh, action figures, we were collecting uh, trading cards, so games like these uh, really simplify uh, the concept, and they just focus on collection. And production costs are rising. Um, this is an excellent example. This is Injustice by Warner Bros. And it's built with the Unreal Engine and both high quality 3D graphics. It's a fighting game, specifically designed for touch devices, uh, where you swipe actions with your fingers. Uh, the game contains all the characters of uh, DC Comics superhero uh, universe. In fact, it's an alternative universe. Uh, that's part, what part of the story is. Um, and you customize your team, and you find missions and challenges. The creative director is Seth Boone, uh, the same person who conceived Mortal Kombat back in the 90s. That game did okay. And uh, one thing I particularly love about Injustice is the fact that when they built Injustice, they didn't think about, oh, how can we crank up the fighting game mechanism into a, a, a touch-enabled um, device. They actually created a new control mechanism uh, specifically for touch-based devices. And uh, basically, uh, you play doing uh, taps and swipes. It takes you a minute to learn, uh, almost like any other casual game. And um, every character has its own special attacks. So uh, as you obtain a new character, you learn uh, what the, the correct swipes and the correct attacks are for that specific character, like, like any other fighting game. And they take a tip from car battle games because the way that you manage your, your, um, uh, your characters, your team, is with cards. And uh, do, all these cards can be purchased um, uh, with gold or with uh, virtual gold or cash. And um, uh, you can also upgrade them. So there's a, an upgrade uh, tree uh, for every card. And there are also support cards, what are called support cards. I can buy a support card specific for my, my character, and that gives uh, him special moves or special, uh, 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 special abilities. So collecting the cards is one of the great appeals of the game. Injustice is like Carvel Games 2.0, in, 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 in my view. And I think we're going to see this uh, more and more. In fact, back in, in, in the talk at GDC, we talk about real racing, how real racing also applied the collection elements of collecting all the cards and being able to have all the cards in order to be able to race, uh, to race on all the different circuits. Um, and, and they play so well, and you can see now we're uh, in July, seven months later, Real Racing stays in the top 30 at all times. And uh, interestingly enough, um, two weeks ago, Electronic Arts uh, had their financial resource and said that Apple is their biggest partner. A company that traditionally was making money out of retail, now Apple is the biggest partner. And this game is one of the uh, two games that they have in the top 30. 
Lastly, uh, it's worth mentioning the excellent work GRI has been doing. Um, they have five titles in the top 50, top uh, uh, grossing uh, iOS chart. And I want to clarify, I'm picking the, the, top, the iOS top grossing chart as a, an example of, of, of what's going on. This is re being replicated also in the Google Play Store, in the Amazon Store, and also on the web uh, through the different portals. Uh, so this same phenomenon of the rise of the mid-core. And um, they've been specializing in sim slash combat games, confrontation, um, and uh, uh, they're a great example of why casual games for men are here to stay. Lastly, men play casual games. Shocking, yeah. And combat and collection are successful elements of gameplay. I think they're, they're, they're key, although you know, um, a competition such as real racing is working really well. Um, and production values are rising really fast. Console game developers are getting into, into the, uh, the, the game now. And, uh, and I think we'll see um, a very interesting games in the future. Certainly one of the sensations of the past year has been the success of King.com, uh, recently renamed to simply King. King's first foray into social gaming came in 2010 with the release of a game called Puzzle Saga. Uh, it used a game mechanic that was basically PopCap's Chuzzle, and it used that as the combat mechanic for a very simple dungeon crawl. Uh, it was a pretty unimpressive game, and it did pretty unimpressive numbers. Um, King followed that up with a bubble popper that they released on Facebook called Bubble Saga. And uh, it was the first time that we saw the progress map that uh, has since become the kind of unifying design principle of the entire Saga series. This is uh, a map that shows your progress through the game, uh, as well as the progress that your friends are making through the game. Uh, this type of map was a mechanic that we'd seen for years in the casual downloadable space, but this was the first time we saw it paired with uh, the potent uh, social possibilities, the social proof, and the social competition that were made possible by the Facebook platform. So uh, Bubble Saga did better than Puzzle Saga, but still nothing too exciting to write home about. A few months later, in October of 2011, King launched another bubble popper on Facebook, this one called Bubble Witch Saga and they finally get, began to get some real traction. Uh, the game uh, hit the top 10 um, and uh, peaked at a DAU of, I think maybe around five million daily players. And then in April of last year, King released Candy Cross Saga. Perhaps some of you may have heard of it. Uh, it was of course a match three game, similar to Bejeweled or uh, Jewel Quest or uh, many other examples. Uh, the game took off like gangbusters and quickly became a top five game on Facebook. And King continued to apply the same saga formula to lots of other mechanics, uh, Mahjong Saga, Pyramid Solitaire Saga, Hoop to Loop Saga, and Pet Rescue Saga. But then came the moment that really set the gaming world on fire. In January of this year, King released an iOS version of Candy Crush Saga. And it wasn't just an iOS version, it was an interoperable version with the Facebook game. So progress that you made playing on one platform was reflected in your game on the other platform. In other words, the two devices were just simply two different windows into the same game experience. The results were incredible. Not only did Candy Crush quickly become a top mobile game, but almost overnight, um, the numbers on Facebook were dramatically lifted as well. And within a few weeks, Candy Crush had become the number one game on Facebook, ending a stretch of over three years where Zynga Game had occupied that spot. And then soon it was the number one game on the mobile charts as well. And on the strength of, of Candy Crush Saga and the other games in the Saga series, King has pulled even with Zynga, and according to some charts, even past Zynga, to become the number one overall developer on Facebook, which would have been unthinkable just six months ago. And Candy Crush isn't just an incredibly popular game, it's an incredibly lucrative game as well. It's currently the 
top grossing game on iPhone, the top grossing game on iPad, and the top grossing game on Android. And it's a top grossing game on Facebook. Holy smokes. But Candy Crush isn't just an incredibly popular game and an incredibly lucrative game, it's become a true cultural phenomenon. We've seen t-shirts, pants, sandals, socks, cakes, cupcakes, fingernail art, greeting cards, and on and on. And then there's humor as well, the you know, sort of humor that you see coming along with the cultural phenomenon, poking fun at how addicting the game is, or how often you're bugged by your friends for extra lives, or for various kinds of help. There's even a fake movie trailer going around for, for a fake Candy Crush movie. So we've seen this sort of phenomenon a few times in the past. Pac-Man, Tetris, in fact, I'm wearing my Tetris socks. Uh, Guitar Hero, Farmville, of course, and most recently, Angry Birds. And no, this isn't a doctored photo. This is a real, um, a real McDonald's in China. So you're saying, but Steve, you know, what good is this to me? Uh, a cultural phenomenon can't be created. It's just something that happens. But a hit game can be created. And if you have a hit game, even if it's not a cultural phenomenon, you can still make a pretty big pile of money. Uh, just look at, for example, the, the two games in the past year from Supercell, Heyday and uh, Clash of the Clans. Not cultural phenomenons, but Supercell's raking in the money on those games. And Candy Crush, I think, um, serves as a great roadmap for how to make a, a hit game. Uh, at this past GDC, there was a really great talk by uh, King's CEO, Ricardo Zaccone, where he laid out King's strategy and how they got to the point they are today. Uh, so remember, you know, King didn't just appear a few years ago. They've been around since 2003. They got their start as a skilled gaming company, uh, a space that I know a lot about because I was at World Winner from the founding of the company in 2000 until middle of 2005. And so over their 10 years running a skill games portal, King developed over 100 games for, for that skill, skill games portal. Um, and then only within the past few years have they been taking games from that stable and porting them over to Facebook and applying this this saga model to turn essentially single player experiences into social experiences. So over the course of 10 years and metrics and other uh, experience, King has learned which of their 100 plus games are the most popular and those are the ones that they're bringing over to Facebook. Further, once they're on Facebook, they take only the most successful ones of those and create interoperable mobile versions. So. The, the success of Candy Crush Saga is actually just the top of a pyramid that's built upon 10 years of work and hundreds of games. So what are the lessons here? The first one is that strategy matters. So King relentlessly pursued the strategy. They didn't do what many companies do, just uh, you know, kind of wildly follow the latest trend or the latest hot game you know, farm games, uh, city builders, casino games. They relentlessly pursued their strategy and, uh, and became the, the top dog in social mobile. Secondly, persistence matters. Uh, I've seen a lot of companies rush into social, try a couple of games, not do well, and then say, oh, this is harder than we thought, and get out, throw in the towel. Um, King didn't give up after Puzzle Saga and after uh, bubble saga, they kept at it, they kept perfecting the saga formula, and you know, of course, we've seen the results. And finally, is that quality matters. Bubble Witch Saga wasn't the first bubble popper game on Facebook, Pet Rescue Saga wasn't the first collapse style game on Facebook, and Candy Crush Saga was coming out into the, into the face of a firmly entrenched and very successful Bejeweled Blitz. Um, and yet, by perfecting and balancing the hell out of these familiar mechanics, King managed to overcome the fact that they didn't have first mover advantage and, you know, of course, uh, as a result, won. In our next trend, we're going to take a quick look at some uh, 
recent and somewhat interesting developments in the casino game world. You can take a look at it through the lens of Big Fish Casino, which is currently the top grossing casino game on iOS, number eight grossing game overall. So over the past years, we have talked off and on about casino games, but we generally talked about games that offered players just a, a single mode of play, a single casino game to enjoy, like Zynga Slingo or Bingo Bash or Zynga Poker. One of the main differentiators for Big Fish Casino and games like it is that they offer players a full and integrated suite of casino games. They let players enjoy a variety of different kinds of classic casino gameplay. This actually brings a number of really positive factors to the table. It brings you a broader demographic, men who enjoy poker, women who enjoy slots or bingo. Uh, so it broadens you out that way. It gives you more retention as when players get bored or frustrated with one game, uh, they can engage with another. It also creates a nice sense that there is sort of stuff to wait for. Um, it kind of takes down the pressure on each new game release you do as long as new stuff is coming out and it's at least decent. You will often have players hang around to see what next week or next month's game is going to be. This is part of the cycle we engendered at, at Pogo when I was working there. The games themselves within Big Fish Casino are honestly um, okay. They're clean, decent looking, solid, predictable core implementations of basic casino mechanics. There's very, very little that distinguishes them from any other generic implementation. Uh, truthfully, you know, we were making much, much funner implementations of, of casual casino games a decade ago at Pogo. Um, but it does distinguish itself from other sort of generic-ish competitors by leaning hard into a couple of key differentiating features. One of those axes is social. Every single game, even stuff that's inherently single player, puts you at a table synchronously with other players that you can chat with, congratulate, get news from, make friends with. It also lets you create new tables just for your friends and to send a variety of fun, flirtatious, and functional gifts to other players, right, to, to help them along. So there's a lot of good relationship expression. Uh, it also offers a much more robust metagame than many of the casino games that are out there. So it's got a nice long leveling arc with uh, unlocking a variety of skins, game variants, and table stakes along the way. And it's got a rich and imaginative achievement system that can keep players engaged over the long term. Before we take a look at the performance of the app in the category, I just wanted to talk for a couple of minutes about some of the pluses and minuses of making casino games from my experience, having done a few. Um, you come into it with reduced design risk. Uh, how many people here know how to play blackjack? Problem solved, okay. So you know what the core game mechanics are and what you're gonna be playing with at a base saves a lot of time in the early exploration. Um, you reduce the learning curve for your audience. All your players know how to play blackjack. Might surprise you there, right? Um, so casual gamers really hate steep learning curves. They like to get to the fun fast. Uh, this can help get you there. There's a very well understood monetization model. People go, they know that at the casino you kind of slowly bleed money, you buy more, uh, you bring more if you wanna play at the high stakes table, people understand what they're buying and why they're buying and they do it a lot in social casino games. Um, and if you go down this integrated path, you can become an ecosystem where what you're doing in each game in terms of retention, engagement, bring new audience, helps you feed everything else, right? So you can get a, a virtuous synergy out of your game catalog. On the downside, because your mechanics are well understood and out there in the market, um, it's not that much harder for anybody else in this room to go implement the core blackjack mechanic right, than it is for big fish. Uh, so it's easy to take that along. If you decide you want to pivot out of that and really differentiate your game and have some kind of clever variant, players that are expecting that core casino experience that they know and love may have some resistance. It can be a struggle to get that adoption. Um, and I'll also add that casino math is extremely finicky, right? One error, one thing you fail to consider in your spreadsheet can completely break the economy in your game. And this is a big danger of having an ecosystem, right? One broken game that's a fountain of currency can kill your monetization in a heartbeat. So you need to be really good and really careful with your game balance. So how is Big Fish Casino done? Uh, are they happy? Uh, I would be happy with that. So uh, pretty much since it came on, it's been a consistent top 20 grossing app uh, on the App Store. This despite the fact that it's severely tailing off in terms of downloads, right? So they're doing a great job of retaining and monetizing those existing players. They also tried to launch on Facebook, got no traction, right? So this looks like a, a fairly serious play. Um, 
So who else is out there? There are a few notables playing in this integrated space. Uh, GSN's done some nice work and they're getting some good traction with it, uh, particularly on iPad. Um, on Facebook, Double Down and Double U Casinos have integrated offerings. And there are one or two other people making single casino offerings. So uh, if anybody stumbled any, over any casino games on the way into the room, I apologize. Um, so what can we take from this as developers? So first of all, casino games are interesting to a lot of folks in part because they have great monetization, right? A recent Casual Connect report put the average lifetime value of a paying slots player at $73. That's money. The field is crowded. There are a lot of people out there, but there are a lot of people making money here. Eight of the top 50 grossing games on iPhone, 15 of the top 50 grossing games on Facebook are social casino games. So even in the second and third tier, money's coming in. When this pivots into real money, the folks that can play there are going to make a lot of money and this is happening, right? Nevada's legalized online gambling, New Jersey's legalized online gambling, either as a nation or state by state, we will tumble in almost inevitably in the next two to three years. It's not easy to get there. There are complex regulatory hurdles to be able to do real money gaming, but the money that people make there puts our category to shame. And Remember, your gameplay is generic and, you know, easier to copy than a farm game, right? Make sure you understand what your unique selling proposition is, why people should play your casino game in a vast, undifferentiated field. Otherwise, it's very, very easy to get lost in the noise layer. This, this next trend is uh, uh, really exciting for me because this, um, it's a genre that has uh, pretty much been created in, in the web and the mobile space. And it, it's, it doesn't happen too often that we actually see uh, a genre that obviously comes from uh, uh, platformers, but endless runners uh, are inspiring platformers but have simplified it to adapt itself to the devices that we play today. Um, and as you will see, the word endless might be dropped from the description of the genre based on the new games that we see recently. It all started with this game, Cannavault. Uh, it, it, it was very simple. You just press one key and you jump and you have to avoid obstacles and jump from one building to another. Uh, the guys at Half Brick then saw how compelling Cannavault was and contributed to a genre with uh, a Jetpack Joyride. And now coins had to be collected, uh, enemies have to be avoided, and weapons can be used. Complexity was uh, added and the C axis was added when Temple Run came out. It wasn't sufficient to just jump. Uh, now there were three lanes and you had to jump or dodge uh, or uh, 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 move around and you have enemies behind you. Um, and it was extremely successful. But we didn't see a free to play game until this one came out, Subway Surfers. Um, and Subway Surfers appeals to a, a, a younger crowd with its very extensive customization shop. There are plenty of characters to buy in Subway Surfers and that is their main monetization model. And recently the game added boosters uh, that the player can use during gameplay. Um, Subway Surfers later on also added a mission system and this is where, where uh, uh, endless runners start uh, becoming something else. Um, and basically, there are a series of milestones. You have to uh, achieve uh, a 6,000 feet. You have to uh, jump over um, a six uh, a, a train cars, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, that can actually help. But one of the things that I, that I personally see is that uh, an endless runner by itself doesn't appeal to everybody because no, not everybody wants to start from zero every time they play the game. And I think GameLove recognized that, and they one up Subway Surfers when they create the Speak All Me Minion Rush. The Speak All Me Minion Rush is in the top 20, 20, top 30 continuously on iOS, and it's doing really well on Android as well. Um, it, not only does the games have all the elements of Subway Surfers, but it adds stages. So when you complete a stage, uh, when you get to the end of the stage, you unlock the next stage, and you're playing from that stage from then on. So there are new scenarios, production values are much, much higher. 
Um, and another thing that, uh, that it called my attention is that at the end of every stage, there's a boss fight. So it's not just about avoiding, it's also interacting. So um, in, in the case of the Speaker of Mimi and Rush, what you do is um, you avoid uh, the robots that the boss throws at you, but there are certain robots that you can tap and throw back to the boss. And that's how you beat the boss. And in every stage, there's a new boss. Um, it's a very rich uh, game, especially because of all the characters that are available in, the, in, the mo in both movies. And interestingly enough, because of the fact that they were that are using a 3D engine and a 3D environment, they played with the cameras. So in the, the boss fight, you see the camera in front of you, so you see the character running towards you. But in other levels, they move the camera to the side, so it, it, it works almost like the classic cannibal. This is uh, something that is very interesting. And another thing that I also see in, in, in runners uh, that is becoming integrated is the idea of um, uh, competing against uh, your friends. And Singa did a fairly decent job when uh, uh, running with friends. Basically, what they do is they pull the information from uh, your friends' scores, and they, um, uh, uh, when, you, when you're playing, they put the characters um, uh, in the game, and based on their, on their scores, and you have to out, uh, uh, outscore them. Works fairly well. So, simple and addictive, I think runners are here to stay, uh, and I'm looking forward about, uh, to see what other things uh, developers can come up with, what other elements of gameplay they can add to these games. But they need to be much more than endless. Uh, uh, missions and other actions are definitely key. Uh, I don't think you can compete with just creating a game where people start from zero all over uh, every time. And definitely, uh, you have to think that because of the fact that you're competing against these games, uh, uh, it, it cannot be just a, sim a simple uh, a game uh, in terms of visuals. It needs to have great production values. And and now we come to the final section of the year in review where we reveal for the first time that you've been wasting your time for the last 45 minutes, and in fact, for the last three days. The, uh, the great Hollywood screenwriter, William Goldman, um, he wrote uh, The Princess Bride and uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, many other great films. He's written a wonderful memoir of his years as a Hollywood screenwriter entitled Adventures in the Screen Trade. And there, right at the start of the book in bold print, he lists the number one lesson that you need to know to understand why Hollywood works the way it does. And that is, nobody knows anything. But Hollywood is an open book compared to the conundrum of an enigma that is the computer games industry. Time after time, we hear conventional wisdom. We hear the experts say something, only to find that it's completely dead wrong. For example, for years we were told, Word games are dead. I have friends who run small, casual development studios who try pitching word games and they're told over and over again, word games are dead. Stop pitching us word games. People don't want to play them. They're impossible to localize. And yet, several of the top free-to-play games over the past year are word games, things like Words with Friends and Scramble with Friends and Ruzzle. How can this have happened? Because nobody knows anything. In the core space, we see lots of games with dragons and other classical fantasy trappings, but casual players want mainstream things, mainstream themes, things like solving mysteries or running a restaurant. Leave the fantasy stuff for, for the core gamers. And yet, games about dragons have abounded in the free-to-play space this year, appealing to casual gamers by the millions. For example, Dragonvale was one of the top grossing games on iOS. Dragon City is a top 10 game on Facebook. And in Japan, Puzzles and Dragons has been a complete sensation. Uh, one of those mass market cultural hits like I discussed when I was talking about Candy Crush. And in fact, it's, it's on its way to becoming the most lucrative mobile game ever made. What's going on here? Well, it's just a matter of nobody knowing anything. 
After several years of having a stranglehold on the number one slot in the Facebook leaderboards, it was a given that that spot would always be occupied by a Zynga game. With their development teams many times the size of, of competitors' development teams, with their most favored nation status with Facebook, with their ability to instantly cross-sell millions of players from one of their uh, successful games into a new game, it was just a given that Zynga would, would always have that slot as a birthright. And yet, in February of this year, Candy Crush Saga sat atop the Facebook leaderboard. And it did this after doubling its DAUs almost overnight when the game was already nine months old. How could this have happened? Because nobody knows anything. Hidden object games are the number one game in the casual downloadable space and have been for many years. And yet, we didn't see hidden object games on Facebook. Why? Because we were told the business model doesn't work. Hogs won't work as a free-to-play game. And then came Gardens of Time and Hidden Chronicles, top games on both social and mobile. And uh, all of a sudden, there was new conventional wisdom. Hogs are the biggest thing on Facebook. So over the next year, we saw a flurry of hidden object games come out, games like Animal Kingdom and Hidden Haunts and Jet Set Secrets, completely flopped. So were the experts right before they were wrong? Or wrong before they were right? Or is it just that nobody knows anything? So now the new, new wisdom was same as the old wisdom. Hidden object games don't work on Facebook. Their time has passed. The market is saturated already. Players are tired of them. And then a few months ago, a game comes out from a little French developer that nobody has heard of called Pretty Simple. The game is called Criminal Cases. And with no money to spend on marketing, with no other successful games to, to cross-promote into, uh, into criminal cases, the game over the course of a few months has risen to be, become a top five game on Facebook with about six million daily players. How could this have happened? Because nobody knows anything. And finally, over my 10 or so years in the casual game space, you know, one of the fundamentals that I know is that casual players don't want frustration. They want simple, easy fun. In fact, it was the very first joint lecture that I ever gave with Dave when he said something like, Casual players want two buttons, one that says win and one that says win big. And yet, Candy Crush Saga is perhaps the hardest and most punishing game that I've ever played. It's not just, it's not just hard, it's tear your heart out and put it in a blender hard. And yet, it's by far and away the most successful casual game today. What's going on here? How could experts have been so wrong? How could I have been so wrong? It's simple. Nobody knows anything. So you've been dutifully listening as the three of us have been talking for the past 45 minutes. And now you know that it's all crap. Because even though we're experts in the field, nobody knows anything. All we're doing is making educated guesses that are perhaps a teensy-weensy bit more likely to be accurate than, say, if you asked your Aunt Gladys in Sheboygan. But Steve, I hear you say, sure, maybe that was true in the old days, but now we live in the future. Now we live in an age of metrics. Now we should know everything. Well, metrics are fine for knowing whether you should charge 40 cents or 80 cents for your virtual cow or whether your invite friends button will work better if it's green or if it's blue. But there's really no substitute for experience and intuition when it comes to the big decisions about what's fun and what's going to work. All metrics can really do is help you sand off some of the rough edges. And that's what every expert will tell you. So you know it must be true. Thank you. So it looks like we have about five minutes for Q&A.
Is there a mic? I'll just talk. So, um, one other big thing that happened last year is a ton of overseas developers rose up and just crushed the top chart. We've got Finland coming on strong. We've got Japan, of all things, crushing the Western market. Any thoughts? Well, I think it just speaks to the fact that these platforms are very open to, well, for, certainly as Dave said, the mobile platform is still very open to, uh, to new entrants. And, you know, there's really no regional or geographic advantage, uh, you know, I think wherever quality comes from. And, you know, I think if you look at, say, the games from Supercell, you know, they're undisputably of extremely high quality. So, of course, they're going to win regardless of, of what their country of origin is. Um, and the only question is, you know, do they have global appeal? you know, or do they have regional appeal? And, you know, in the case of, say, Puzzles and Dragons, you know, it's still to be proven if that has global appeal, it certainly has insane appeal within, within Japan. Uh, with the Supercell games, yes, clearly global appeal. Anybody else? Go on. Going once. Going twice. Gone. What? Yeah, yeah. What? Uh, what? Uh, what? Uh, question. So, um, you talked a little bit about how uh, men like to play casual games as well. And one of the things that kicks ice about, say, what about Factory of Monsters was hey, this game, we made it really global, we had a global appeal, but when we made it more hardcore, we had better metrics. So then you have Clash of Clans come out with a very global appeal. So, is it that mobile gamers actually like more, they have a better shot with a more global appeal, even for a mid core game? No, I don't think so. I mean, Injustice uh, it looks like a really hardcore game. Uh, visually, it looks like a really hardcore game, although it's much easier to uh, interact with. Um, uh, the, the ramp up of, of Injustice is lower than, let's say, um, uh, Battle Pirates or Bucky Monsters. Uh, 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 so, uh, but I see, uh, like you can see, Modern War or a War of Nations, which are uh, Greek games, and they have themes that are really uh, dark as well. So um, uh, the success of Kixai on the web can be completely translated to uh, tablets, in my opinion. It's just that they're not focusing on it. And thank you for raise, uh, uh, talking about Kixai. I focus my part of the talk on uh, on, on uh, mobile games uh, uh, or tablet games, but Kixai is an excellent example of people that are doing great on the web. Um, there's a lot of other developers who are doing great on the web, and Congregate is the portal right now for uh, mid-core gamers. They're becoming a brand now that they're doing uh, mobile mobile publishing, I think they're, they're, they're moving into the mobile space. And I wouldn't be surprised that a year from now, when we, we look at mid-core gamers um, uh, or, or successful mid-core games, we'll see Congregate at the top of the list. So, you know, the other thing I throw down there is, of course, you know, if you're looking to maximize the, the revenue in your game, fundamentally there are two metrics you can be pushing, right? So one is really about depth, which is kind of your, your ARP DAO and your ARPPU access, which is what Kixai and Kabam are, are kind of incredibly masterful at, right? Is just really not caring that their funnel attenuates incredibly quickly and they're down, you know, well below that, you know, 10, 15% player retention because they're so good at pitting those players against each other and then monetizing that revenge factor. Uh, Supercell, I think, is really illustrative of the opposite path in the mid-core game, which is, I doubt that, I, and I don't have the data, you'll notice that when they publicize themselves, they talk a lot about total revenue flow, but very little about the prepare stats that Kixai and Kabam tend to talk about. Um, my guess is that their DAUs are just much, 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 much higher uh, with a significantly lower ARP DAO. Both paths are valid, they have, they suggest really, really, really different feels and development paths for your product. Cool. Good for them, Ben. <laughs> so, uh, but I guess the, the only question I would throw out there in terms of uh, the height is, um, again, you look at the, the kabams and the kick size, Right, the, the figures that those guys have put out there are, are very, very stacked. So you're saying that the, um, the supercells are a multiple of that on Clash? Cool. Yeah. Right. 
Yeah, I mean, again, that's similar across, I think, any of these games that have strong PvP leaderboards, right? It is, uh, if you're doing a hardcore game where it's possible to reach the, if you're doing a PvP game where it's possible to reach the top of the leaderboard spending under 5 to 10k, you're probably doing it wrong. <laughs> Right. Um, in order for the distribution to make sense at all, in order for the, the average number to add up, that top of the stack has to be very, very high. Any other questions, guys? Yes, the back. Sorry, could you repeat the last bit of the question? The financials across the industry and. Yeah, go, go ahead. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, um, uh, Supercell is uh, revealing constantly that they're making at least $600,000 a day on each of their games. So uh, that gives you more or less a parameter on uh, how much money is it, uh, number one making. Interesting enough, what I've seen based on the success of my games is that the, the, the revenue starts coming down, um, uh, but it's much more gradual than what the PC industry was for us uh, seven, eight years ago. Uh, it, basically, just to give you some parameters, in the PC gaming industry, PC uh, download gaming industry, uh, eight years ago, the number one would make half the mar the number two would make half the money of the number one. So it was a very, very hit during business. Whereas iOS and Android, the, the revenue start becoming uh, uh, less and less, but very gradually. So um, there are some other numbers. Uh, Gangho makes uh, 4.9 million a day on Puzzles and Dragons. Uh, that's because they 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 have a, a much more global yeah, much more global uh, uh, reach. Um, and there's some other numbers, uh, but th those just to give you an idea because we have to go. Yep. Uh, so so we're off the podium. Thank you all for coming. Um, we'll I guess hang around just outside if anyone has any other questions.